The time has come to welcome another vintage calculator to my collection. This is a fairly rough Casio 121L. I bought this unit untested because when I picked it up at the thrift store, there was no power cable connected to it. This calculator has a fairly typical looking 2-pin AC connector on the back, but that's not quite always the whole story. This RCA reel-to-reel -reel player also has a 2-pin power connector on the side, but you'll notice that it is 9 volts DC. The Commodore VIC-20 is another example of something like this. It also has a fairly standard looking 2-pin power connector, but you can see that this is AC 9 volts. Now this unit doesn't actually say what the power input is on the back, but I was able to guess that it was 120 AC based on eBay listings that came with those types of cables with it. Now I couldn't actually find one of those cables at Goodwill, so I had to wait until I got home to determine if it even works. There are some other ways you could make an educated guess, like this calculator is very heavily weighted towards the back, which means that there's probably a big transformer back there. However, calculators with a rechargeable battery were a thing in this time period, so I wouldn't just assume that. Now the best way to be able to tell what it needs for power would be to open it up and take a look at where the power going into it goes. If it goes to a small transformer, it's probably a small AC power supply. If it seems to just go directly into passive components, then it's likely a DC power supply. But we do know that this one is just 110 AC, so let's try and power it up. Now this calculator has been working just fine for me, unlike that unfortunate unisonic calculator I previously showed. So far it looks like all of the features are fully functional. Unfortunately, it isn't in the greatest cosmetic shape. There's clearly been some kind of water damage, it's got a ding here, and everything's just a bit dirty. So I'm gonna have to take this thing apart and give it a good cleaning. But it is nice that it still works. Now this new Casio calculator shares an interesting history with my previous Sony calculator. Now these two calculators don't share anything technologically as far as I'm aware, but they were both previously owned by the Mountain Bell Phone Company. Like my Sony calculator, both of these were engraved with the asset tag as well, but thankfully they engraved this one on the bottom, not the top, unlike my poor Sony here. I'm not looking to become a Mountain Bell collector, but it is a fun coincidence. Technologically speaking, this calculator is obviously more similar to my Unisonic one. On top of both of them using VFD tubes for their display, this one also most likely uses a monolithic calculator IC based on its size alone. However, based on the addition of the memory functions and the floating point control, we can assume that it's not the same MOSTEC chip that this one's using. Which would probably be why this one still functions as a calculator, and this one does not. While we're on the topic of what's inside of it, I think it's time for us to crack this thing open. So, let's take a look at what we have going on inside. Well, I'd definitely say that's far from a monolithic IC. That is pretty interesting, because I know this calculator was produced later than the Unisonic. Wow, there is so much cool stuff going on in this calculator. This this was a good pickup. The closest thing I can find to a date code in here is the 733 on this IC5304. Now, 1973 would make sense for this calculator, but that would be a very unusual date code format, unless the month is being represented hexadecimally. I would feel fairly confident saying all these dipped upright packages are probably resistor networks, which is kind of cool because neither one of the other calculators from this era has those in it. Some support for that theory is that everywhere else there are different capacitors, they're all different values in one location. So it makes sense that they would use these resistor packages if they were just doing pull-ups or something. And of course, I can't forget, this calculator uses VFD tubes. But for me, like the Sony, the magnetic reed switches for the keys in this steal the show. I'll take these over optical switches any day. Well, I think that's enough gobbing at the gorgeous insides of a vintage device, and time to start doing some cleanup and restoration. After taking all the screws out, the keyboard lifts out easily enough, after also removing the very stubborn slider knob. But I do see that the cover for the front of the VFDs has been plastic welded in place, and I don't really feel like trying to take that apart and glue it back in, so I'm just going to leave that alone for now. 
Now, if we get up close in here, it looks like there's some kind of protective film on top of the metal, but I'm not 100% sure, but it, I don't really have much else of a choice. It's coming off, so I might as well remove it and hope for the best underneath. Yeah, that rather drastically improved the appearance overall. Still a few scuffs along the front I'll need to try and work off, but that's much, much better. Now it looks like the metal plate on top bends around front on here and latches in place. So perhaps I can just fully remove it. Unless it is also adhered in. Sounds like there's adhesive under the whole thing. So I'm gonna get out the heat gun and see if I can loosen that and then just lift it right off. Ah, there we go. This looks pretty mangled now, but it's very thin metal, so I'll be able to push it back into shape and make it look pretty good. I think this looks considerably better now, but before I go ahead and fully return that, I'm going to clean this off in some water to get rid of the dust that's built up and what's going on down in here and just get it a lot nicer looking. That's looking worlds better, but I think I'm going to do something a little controversial. These two lines along the screen are clearly meant to be silver. The bottom one still is for the most part, but the top one's been worn away. Now I'm going to silver sharpie that to return it to how it should look but they won't match afterwards. So if it looks too distinct, I'm gonna Sharpie that one too. All right, let's see how this goes. Yeah, those really don't match. It's kind of hard to tell on video, but I am gonna go ahead and do the bottom one as well. All right. That absolutely overall looks better. Now I'm going to put this back on. I'm not going to put on any additional glue. I'm going to see if I can get the original glue to re-adhere after applying some heat. All right, that looks pretty even to me. Let's melt the glue. All right, I think that's gonna work. Now I just need to bend the metal tabs back in front into place and it should be fully locked in. Really didn't think this thing was all that great looking when I first picked it up, but it's it's starting to become pretty appealing now. I think I'm gonna use some magic to clean this part. Oh, that's looking way better now. At this point this thing's pretty much ready to go back together, except there's one more thing I want to take a look at. Now this right here, I couldn't really see before, I suspect that is an overflow indicator light. And I haven't seen it turn on once, which means that the bulb inside of there has probably gone bad. All right, let's give this calculator something that's a bit of a workout. And yes, it should overflow, but I'm pretty sure that this light should come on. Let me check the voltage of what that is when it's in an overflow state. 
Well, I gotta admit, I'm not really sure what's going on here. So, if we reset it, punch in a number, punch in another number to make it overflow, multiply them, no change. If we, say, divide by zero, nothing. We can even overload the accumulator and nothing happens. Well, maybe it flashed briefly. Uh, that's not conclusive. So I'm not really sure if I either don't understand what that's doing or it's not functional in the power supply. However, if I shut it off, disconnect it, try and run a continuity test, I see that it is open. So if it is an incandescent bulb, it's definitely been burnt out. All right, well, this gets rather complicated. So first off, I'll say that this wire on the lamp LED, I'm not 100% sure because it's DC voltage, so it could be a DC lamp. But that side is 14 volts when the unit's on. This side is clearly a low side driver, and that comes down to that resistor there, which then connects to the collector of this transistor, which has the base connected to this resistor, which that resistor goes all the way over to this pin on this IC, which the nearest I can find online is a shift register. Now, I haven't been able to see the voltage on that pin change at all. So possibly in addition to this no longer functioning, I think this chip may not work anymore because the base voltage never changes on the transistor that drives the lamp. And here that is in action. So one side of the light is 14 volts. Yep. And the base of the transistor here is ground. So let's go ahead and try and change something. So let's do an obviously overloaded problem. That's not really needed. It's not touching. And we will see nothing changes on the base. Let's do divide by zero. Nada. So something's going wrong. I think the shift register that I can't find the pinout for is possibly not working. Maybe just that output's no longer functioning. But I don't see a lot of point in trying to replace this light if the whole signal that drives it isn't working. And in addition, if I try to bypass the transistor and go straight to ground, the lamp does not turn on and no current flows. So it is burnt out. But there's also no voltage happening, so again, still no reason to replace it. Now to spare the time of anyone who will recommend that I replace this with a 595 since I mentioned it's a shift register, note the pinout is not the same. That is not ground. That is. If the only thing that's gone wrong with this in 45 years is a single output on a single shift register, I'd say it's doing pretty good. I didn't set out to become a vintage calculator collector, but I'm definitely in that group now. I wonder what I'll end up with next. I hope you guys enjoyed this, and I'll see you next time.